So hello everyone um, and welcome to day two of Pitch to Scale. Um, I'm pleased to be joining you. My name is Anna Flockett and I'm the editor of Startups Magazine. We're based over in the UK and we're a print and digital publication that champions um, tech startups and small businesses and shares their stories and helps them along their entrepreneurial journey. Um, and I'm pleased to be here introducing today's session, Growth Hacking, with you, which is going to be looking at emerging trends that are making waves in the industry and looking at how stimulating innovation is an effective um, way to ensure sustainable growth. And to give this workshop, I'm super pleased to be introducing you now to Mine, startup mentor and founder of Vistasant. Um, Mine, the floor is yours. Um, welcome, welcome to the session today. Thank you, Anna. It's great to be here. And I cannot wait to uh, start our presentations, our talk uh, about growth hacking. Before we start, I would really like our audience to uh, be engaged and to like, because I really want to keep this interactive. So if they can ask their questions as we move along and they can just like pop in all the questions so that we can, I can answer them as I'm just like going through. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so today we will be talking about growth hacking. It's, it's like a huge topic, but since today we have half an hour, I'll just like keep it short. We'll uh, leave some time for your questions. So first, I would like to show you what we are going to be talking about today. So what you should be expecting from today's agenda. First, I'll introduce you to uh, the Lean Canvas methodology and how it is going to help you build your uh, business model and also how to uh, act as a fundamental for your business. Then we will talk about how to find your early adapters. And then we will talk about a little bit about the channels and I will give you some examples of uh, successful growth hacking uh, cases. Okay, so. This is the Lean Canvas methodology. I'm not sure if you have uh, heard of it. And this is a methodology that is helping you to build a prototype of your business idea so that you can test it with your customers. And this is really a fundamental uh, of building your business. And why? Because it will help you define your target customers so that you are not spending uh, any money or like wasting any uh, of your money to a customer base that is not potentially your target or that you are focusing on um, non-relevant, irrelevant uh, problem or a solution that you would be working on with your product or service. So the first quadrant on the Lean Canvas, the first place that we start is the customer segment. So uh, on the Lean Canvas, you have to define your customer segment with like three to four personas with their lifestyles. And I will also give you examples. If we will have time at the end, I will also give you examples of how to do it. But the, the most important thing, and that is also the key to a successful growth hacking uh, campaign is identifying your early adapters. So it is really crucial, why? Because not everyone can be your customer. And even if you have your target customers, you need to have a niche. Because like for all the products and like now we are in the internet age. So whatever comes to your mind as a new idea, as a new service, is coming to the, the mind of another person across the globe. So it's not really unique as you would think. So it's really important that you are tapping onto a market, a customer base that is really a niche. And it is really important to work on that so that you are just like relying on that customer base that is more inclined to buy your product or get your service. So I put here Instagram. 
to give you an example. So why Instagram? And I wish this was like interactive so that we could, get, I'm not sure if we can get questions uh, here too. Can I just like see them as comments in the chat section? But if you can just like put it in the q and I can see them. What was, you know, do you know what was uh, working for Instagram? What made Instagram successful? Do you, do you have any idea about that? What made Instagram stick out? I will just like wait for 30 seconds to see the amount of users. Well, what was the initial thing? What was the initial, yes, the amount of users is making them really ahead of the competition, but how did they get, because amount of users is really the essence of growth hacking, but how did they manage to get those customers in the first place? What was their success, do you know? Why did it work? Because the reason was, that they were tapping onto a market on, on a customer base that was niche, that was untapped. And that was being able to only share your photos. Because like we had Facebook, but with the Facebook, you know, the feeds, you can just like write the text, you can just like, you know, comment, share events. So it was, just, you know, too crowded. So if you were to show your... Okay, no, I'm not, okay. I was just like checking the comments. No, I'm just like going to be talking for a minute. So uh, the reason why it was really successful that people actually had the need of showing off what they were living, their experience. And so they really wanted to show only the photo, but not get lost within that feed. And so that's why people really loved it. And they were, so they really love the idea of only being able to present, to share their photos. And that's why people started, it was first the, the, the lifestyle bloggers or like the influencer who used that. And they were their early adapters. So that is the importance of defining, of identifying your early adapters. For the Instagram users, since they were like the bloggers, they were like the, 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 the influencers who were already sharing what they were doing, what they were buying, where they were going. So they were just like sharing their experiences through the photos. And that's why their early adapters really adopted this more easily than the others would. And they, they were also the ones who, got only, who already had the followers. They either had the followers on their blog or their network or their community. So they were attracted into this and they started sharing it with their community. And so that's how it exponentially grew over time. So the next thing is uh, that I would like to mention is defining your early adapters is also important to know where to put your money to. And that is you should be spending your money wisely. Why? Because as you would know, 20% of your customers, they are going to be bringing you the 80% of your total revenue because they are their, your valuable customers. They're your profitable customers. And it's important to spend that money either to attract them or to increase their engagement on your platform. So it's really important to define those so that you are not uh, spending your money on the customer base that is not profitable for you. And I'll give you an example. By the way, I'll give you an example from my personal life as well. And also give you an example from uh, like airlines, any VIP services. Why do they just like spend their money, spend their time making their services even better, let's say on business class? Or why would the, the banks, the, the insurance companies, why are they making sure that their top customers are being serviced even better? Because they are the ones who are bringing the profit. So that's why you should be focusing on getting, attracting profitable customers. And they are, so early adapters, and then your profitable customers, the ones 
who are more inclined to spend more money. And I'll give you an example with this. So I'm also a happiness coach and I start the happiness coach certification program in Turkey for the first time. And I'm based in Turkey. And it was the first program in Turkish ever, first ever. So I started a social media campaign and I also did some uh, both uh, ads on social media. But the quality of the leads, they were really lower than I was expecting to get. And the, the, the affordability, because the, the certification course is the, the program is not that, let me say not affordable, but that was not the price that the leads that were coming through those ad campaigns from social media could afford. So after I realized that, I just like stopped the campaigns because I saw that it was not working on that channel. So the second thing that is really important is to understand where your customers are. So for me, for that program, my early adapters, like the, because this was like the first program, so I didn't have any word of mouth, I didn't have any testimonials, it was like, you know, fresh, new, from scratch in this market. So what I did, I just like looked at who my early adapters would be, and I just like uh, identified that niche segment of life coaches, and also mentors who were already inclined to buy another program, something else to put, to add on to their experience, to add on to their expertise. So that's how I went to those communities of coaches. I, I just like reached to the influencers. I reached to the bloggers who were recommending these programs, who were talking, already sharing like those in those com, uh, communities. They were already exchanging ideas about these new programs. And so that was the place I needed to be. And for me, picking the wrong channel, one, I wasted my time. Two, I wasted my money. And three, I could not get results. So I couldn't have the leads that I wanted to get. So defining your early adapters and also picking the right channel is essential. And you need to understand where you really your customers are uh, getting it, buying the service, the product that you are offering them. Where do go to find it, to find the options? Or how do they get influenced? So in my case, it was the influencers. It was uh, the, the coaches. So you should be finding those uh, people, the influencers, the, the key people who can influence, who can influence your users, your target customers, your early adapters, so that they can get influenced to buy your products. So it's really important to uh, pick your channels right, so that you are spending your money, you're spending your bucks on the right channel. And uh, sometimes it can be, now it's really popular to do it through digital marketing tools, but it may not always be the case. So it could be, I will be showing you some tools, but it could be like a traditional method. It's only a matter of where your customers are. Where are they? What, where is their traffic? Where is the, 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 the footsteps are coming from? So it's really, the foot traffic is really important. And you need to identify those before you start your uh, campaign. Okay, so these are some popular growth hacking methods and I'll be just like uh, briefly talking about them. The piggybacking, the partnership, it's a win-win thing. And think about it this way. There is a company who already has um, a established network, a customer base, and your product, your service is helping them. So you should be finding those partners, those uh, companies that are already selling something that have a customer base that is also your customer base. Let's say, think about the mobile stores, mobile phone stores. If you are producing an accessory or if you're just like producing something or if you have an app, that's going to help the customers using that phone. And that's also going to increase the selling of the revenue of the phone company. Then they would be also willing to get your service 
so that they are also adding value to what they offer to their customer. So whatever you're building, just like identify your customer and see who else is sharing your uh, early adapters, who is sharing your uh, customer base, so that you can go to those companies to piggyback on their established customer base. I when I was uh, giving this uh, session to at one of the accelerator programs, I was giving the back then it was like all uh, the event space was much different, and we had event right. And one of the the startups had this idea that they wanted to uh, do uh, matching AI based matching with the attendees of the event. So I was suggesting them to go to Eventbrite because they didn't have that functionality. And I suggested them to go and talk to Eventbrite because on Eventbrite, the, the attendees, they were already there. The event organizers were already there. So their target customer was there. And for Eventbrite, it would be, it would mean that they would also offer something else something like a value added service to their customers. So it was like a win-win thing. So please try to find those win-win situations and how you can uh, reach out to those companies to offer them this partnership. Referral marketing, this is like the most common one. Referral mar marketing comes in all ways. Like um, when you buy something, you can just like the, the company would ask you to just like refer to a friend so that you earn extra points, extra money, extra, um, you know, some um, extra benefits uh, to your package. So you can use referral mar marketing for your product. So whatever you're uh, selling, if you can just like give extra perk to your existing customers so that they can share it with their uh, the friends, their family. So it's the easiest because the thing is they already bought your products. So they're your like natural ambassadors. They're already there. So there is nothing you need to do to win them. You already won them. So it's much easier for them to, uh, you know, share it with and share it, you know, frankly with their network because they already bought it. And freemium method, freemium is giving a certain segment of your product or your service for free. So people can just like start using it. So you get them in and then you can just like, you know, upsell the complete solution that you would be offering to them. Ambassadors, ambassador programs are really effective. So if you're targeting, let's say, a younger uh, generation, you're uh, like a younger crowd, it's always good, it's cheap and also, you know, easier to reach to those uh, university college students. You can just like ask them to even distribute flyers or just like, you know, put stickers like go viral. And it's so easy, so, so easy to reach them. And only a, with a small, like even with a perk, like a free use of your product, free use of your service or like a small amount of money, you can make them just like, you know, be your ambassadors. The video content is still working. Yes, video content is really engaging. Though the, the, the attention span is, has been uh, going lower and lower. So, but video content is uh, really working. So I would advise you to also have a video content and A-B testing for landing pages, for your ads. Whatever you do, please do A-B testing. Because like this is, this is also the, the, the uh, mindset behind lean canvas, lean methodology. You just like build it, you measure it and you pivot it. So it's really important. Don't be, you know, don't be like, okay, I did this, I lost money and okay, I'm not trying again. No, try it. This is the, this is the essence of being an entrepreneur, being a startup uh, founder. So it's fail fast. It's always uh, nice to fail fast. And so test your uh, ads, test your products, test what's working with your early adapters or whether they're your early adapters or not. I will share a couple of uh, success stories with growth hacking. This was Dropbox. They uh, tried referral marketing. It was like a two-sided referral program. So it was like giving both uh, sides a, an offer. And so they grow uh, by 3,900% in 
15 months. This was like awesome. So they started in September 2008 and they only had 100K registered users. And by 2017, they had 33.9 million registered users at 10 billion evaluation. So it's like they really grew and it was like it happened over a short period of time. Viral marketing, this was when Hotmail was new before it got acquired by Microsoft. And for each email, an outgoing email, they had this line. So, I mean, imagine each of your users sending an email and they are promoting your product. This was like brilliant idea. And they only had a single line saying, PS, I love you, get your free email at Hotmail. So whoever sent an email was like an ambassador for that brand and sending out promoting the brand. So they really grew really fast and they had uh, 12 million users just after a year and a half after their launch. And it was sold to Microsoft for $500 million only in 1997. I can't imagine $500 million back in 1997. So it really worked well. And for WhatsApp, there's a law called uh, Metcalf's law, and it's a network, uh, it's valuing the network. So uh, if you are building something that can turn into a network, I would advise you to get the, the benefit of being a network because networks are really working well. The, the, the thing that how you value, how Metcalf was valuing it was like each person so like two telephones is like one connection so five telephones is 10 connection and two, 12 uh, telephones is six to six connections so the the connections in a network is that the connection itself times one less uh, divided by two so like can you see the exponential growth so with two telephones when it's a one connection with 12 telephones is six to six uh, connections and as you will see the the growth of whatsapp that's what happened here that was the network effect. So if you can build a network that really works well, you can just like see an exponential growth over time. By the way, do we have questions? I have one more example. We do. Okay. I yeah. have done just one more example. This is for, this is not a startup, but this was like a mindset. This is growth hacking mindset. So this man he couldn't sell his house at uh, 500,000 pounds. So that's when he decided to do a, a raffle. So he said, okay, I'm doing a raffle for two pounds. So the tickets, he uh, sold the tickets at two pounds. And his aim was to actually, you know, get only uh, 400 pounds. And, he, uh, and the, the goal was 500 pounds. He raised 890,000 pounds. Can you imagine? Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah, it was only two pounds. I mean, you would, and the woman, by the way, the woman who got the house, she paid uh, 40 pounds. So she only uh, got 20 tickets. For 20 tickets, she got the house. So can you imagine? So this is the beauty of girl taking. This is really the, that's why I put it, this is not a startup idea. This is not a, a startup girl hacking technique that it worked, but this is from real life. So you yeah. should have the mindset of growth hacking, not only like, don't focus on like what I should be doing. What is the channel? Have the mindset of growth hacking. Yeah, definitely. Um, I love that. I love that example as well to finish it on. We have got a few questions from the audience. So the first one is, what's the difference between growth rate and profitability? Okay, so uh, growth rate and profitability is, okay. So the scaling, uh, let me say scaling is really important for the startups to get invested. And in that way, you cannot be profitable, but uh, you can be scaling, you can be growing. And the thing is, it's only a matter of how you, let me just like, you know, show one thing. So on the lean canvas, as I was showing, there is a key metric section. So you should be defining what is the key metric to measure the success of your startup. Is it growth? Is it like for the networks, it's the growth, it's the number of users. But if you are like a bank, if you're a financial institution, then it's obviously the, the profitability. 
But sometimes you don't care about profitability, but you care about the, the number of users. So it's, the, it's here that you should be defining how you should be uh, uh, measuring your success. So it's really important to define your those key metrics and it is unique to each startup, it's unique to each business. So you should be uh, defining that for your uh, startup. Yeah, amazing. Um, Another question was, what's the startup's path to profitability and how long will it take to get there? Um, okay, so I would suggest that, okay, let me go back again to my presentation. Yeah, of course. And someone similarly also asked, can you use growth hacking in smaller organizations? So again, guess startups. Yes, yeah, you can, you can, you can just like use it with, any business, any scale, any, you know, uh, value, any scale. Okay, so here, this is also important part, cost structure of revenue streams. This is why only one in 10 startups just go on. You know, this is the one of the main reasons why they fail is because they are not uh, planning this right at the beginning. And that is really crucial for profitability. You need to define, you need to identify those cost structure because like sometimes it's not foreseen. So you have to put everything and you have to just like define the right business model. And if it's not working, by the way, it's really important about profitability. If it's not working, then you should be pivoting your business model as well, your revenue model. So let's say if it's a subscription and I would strongly advised that and you will see also that now we are seeing more SaaS startups so everyone's just like turning into a SaaS model and that is for cash flow because like for a startup it's also crucial that you have a positive cash flow even if you get invested you have to have a longer runway and to do so it's really important to uh, manage that through uh, a steady cash flow and that's why I would advise if you can turn your business into a SaaS model, which is, I'm not sure if uh, there, uh, people are familiar with the term, but is a software as a service. Uh, so I would advise that you turn your revenue model into a software as a service so people subscribe and that you have a steady uh, cash flow throughout time so that you can just like get profitability uh, and in a shorter period of time. Um, amazing. And um, someone else has asked, how do you balance experimentation with tangible results? Okay, so if I'm getting the question right, so uh, the I was not saying, you know, it's there, there's no balance. I because like it's an ongoing process. So it's not like okay, I'm now experimenting, and okay, now it's the tangible results and go. Even the tangible results, they are going to be outdated by the time that you are building something. We are that quick at the moment to react to things. So the thing is, you are always going to be in experimentation. Experimentation will never end, especially during the, these times, because now we are in the, the era of digitalization. Everything is so quick. Everything is growing quick. Everything is just like, you know, uh, going back to normal quick. So the thing is, let, let's, let me give you an example. Clubhouse. During the pandemic, why did Clubhouse became so popular? Because they were tapping onto one significant need for that moment. And what was that? People were locked down. Locked down. They were in lockdown. They, were, they could not interact. They were not being able to go to the events. So that was an entertainment. That was like maybe like the only entertainment that united people. So people were really enthusiastic and it was a VIP thing. So it was like uh, invite only, people loved the idea. But then, you know, it was like, it jumped skyrocketed like, and then it went down so quickly. So what they missed was they were not experimenting. They, it was like skyrocketing. And before they knew it was already outdated. So I hope now they're experimenting something else and that mm -hmm. they will turn it into something more sustainable because the reason why it that did not stay sustainable because it, you know, whatever you were talking in those rooms, 
it, they could not be recorded. So they could not be repurposed. And this is digitalization. This is now the era that we are living. It's all about content. It's all about data. And so what's the use of talking if I cannot repurpose it? Like even yeah. like here, now we are recording this so that uh, Pitch to Scale can repurpose this and use it for the people who could not make it. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. Um, you've got to you've got to think ahead of the game, haven't you? Especially in today's digital world. Um, someone also has asked, how do you prove that digital marketing and growth hacking are different? I did not quite get it. So, I mean, growth hacking doesn't need to be digital marketing. So, like as I was saying, like a growth hacking can be let's say your ambassadors at the university and they can just like, as I said, use flyers. They don't need digital marketing for that. So growth hacking, as I said, is more like a mindset. And it's just like, you know, how it is working. And so usually like it's more vital. It's the, the impact is we are talking about the impact and the scalability. And also it's like an exponential impact. With digital marketing, digital marketing is more like, you know, it's marketing on the digital side. So it's, you know, it doesn't necessarily, so growth hacking doesn't necessarily mean it's digital marketing. Yeah, definitely. Um, Nathan has said, what is, which is better, growth strategy or growth tactic? Strategy. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, the thing is, I mean, you need to, that's why I'm just like saying you need to do the lean canvas because the lean canvas is, creating your strategy. You have to have that canvas. But when I say strategy, it's not like the, the you know, the, the strategy that we were talking like 10 years ago. The strategy, you have to have, of course, tactics and like for daily tactics. So you have to be uh, quick to react to changes, but you need to have a strategy because strategy is like a map. So you need to know where you're going to. But you can change your way. I mean, you can just like change the path you're taking as you are going to that direction. But you need to know your direction. So it's just like a ship. If you're just like on a ship, you need to know where you're going or otherwise you'll be just like, you know, you'll never know which direction to go to. Yeah, definitely. Um, I am conscious of time, but I'll just ask you the last couple that have come through. Um, so someone has said how many stages of growth hacking are there and then someone else has said is growth hacking only for startups which I think we've kind of covered and we've said it's relevant for startups but it can be used by anyone but yeah I'll let you uh, I'll let you cover both of them Mina. So um, is it only for startups? No, the, the, as I said, like for startups, we are seeing growth hacking tactics used by like all companies now because it has become really popular over time. And it has become popular be thanks to digital marketing, of course, and thanks to being digitalized. And we are seeing it working with startups because they need to, like big companies, they have more money and they are just like spending, let's say on billboards or they are spending on video and um, TV ads. But with startups, they only have limited resource, limited budget. And that's how the, the growth hacking idea just like came up, you know, because people were just like, they were thinking about the, the ways to hack, really hack the growth. So the, to that question, growth hacking or growth marketing, growth hacking is more like really hacking the system. You are hacking the, the mindset, mindset of your customer. You're hacking into it. So that you are just like, you know, making that person buy your product. And high impact sales funnels. What strategies? Okay. So is this um, high impact sales funnels? What, what do we mean by that? And is there any universal model for growth hacking? Well, you know, any, the thing is, anything that you would be doing that is get, getting you exponential uh, growth over time is going to be the, uh, the growth hacking model that you are going after. So the, the, that's why the difference between the growth hacking and growth marketing 
it is not the terminology, but like growth marketing is anything that is used, being used to for growth. But with growth hacking, it's going to be one thing that's going to exponentially grow your business. And how many stages of uh, growth hacking are there? As I said, it's really important first to identify your customer, where you are going to be uh, finding your customer and your niche, and then your channels, and then the tools and just like how to read them and how to uh, deliver the results and seeing the results and then uh, acting upon them. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I feel like there's, um, we could go with questions all night. Is there a way that people can get in touch with you so that you, um, so they can carry on asking you questions or they can connect with you further? Are you on LinkedIn? Um, where can people find you, Mina? I am on LinkedIn and they can actually send me an email. I, let me just share my screen. So this is my email, mina at stardust.com. I, the website is www.stardust.com. And they can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm really active on LinkedIn. So whatever they would like to ask, especially around uh, the growth hacking and Lean Canvas, if you, they would like me to help them with how to put their business onto Lean Canvas, how to work with it, I'd be happy to help. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mina, for all your knowledge and your presentation today. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you so much. <laughs>